The Gold Coast, to be called Ghana from March 1957, was a post-colonial enigma in sub-Saharan Africa. Its charismatic leader, Kwame Nkrumah, largely created this aura. Highly critical of colonial governance, this well-known Pan-Africanist presented through his personality and activities a political trinity. Prophetic to some, controversial to others, and dictatorial in the eyes of some analysts of the African situation. Ghana and Africa, he believed, were one. He endeavoured continually to bring us freedom and liberty. He could have been right in a sense, but he had debatable ideas which defined how the contours of the economy of this newly independent country would be shaped and the nation fared. Fifty years on, have the dreams of the forefathers been realised? There are still challenges created out of earlier political instability. Weak political structures and economic institutions, sometimes heading towards collapse, but still beams of hopes and progress. What was the purpose of the recovery programme under the PNDC? Iva Ajiman Dua, an author and in his three-part television series, an economic historian, takes us through a huge journey of challenges, atonement and progress. In structures and institutions in a post-colonial economy, he takes us through how the colonial economy changed to post-colonial under Kwame Nkrumah and the consequences of this. Part two, a vampire economy with a silver lining, looks at the role of public policy and in the third part, crossing the Jordan. Stimulation and innovation in the economy, which accesses the growth of Ghana's financial and private sectors. The good news for Ghana's 21st century economy has been its discovery of oil and how an emergent oil economy could address its challenges and promise. The arguments or commentaries of 20 distinguished economists, bureaucrats, politicians and scholars are used in all. Every economy hedges on structures and institutions, civil service, diplomatic missions, the secretariat of presidency and the extent to which these institutions enhance national progress. The post-colonial economy of Ghana from 1957 had to do likewise, how to build from the departing British colonial type which served a different purpose. Anin Achinketo joined Ghana's civil service 44 years ago and saw how it fared under an African authority. I, I think that it is uh, a painful truth that one must accept uh, that the, the whole rationale of colonialism was that the African was incapable of governing himself and therefore that you needed an authority to direct the life of, of the African. And so the colonial administration was one that was staffed certainly at the top level exclusively by British citizens and their duty and focus essentially, was to ensure stability and total respect of the administration under which we, we came and, and also to make sure that they administer the colonies for the benefit of the colonial power. That was what it was. Indeed, it would have been strange if after Kwame Nkrumah's agitation for independence, the same structures have been maintained. Of course, uh, politicians come and politicians go. But uh, the public service tends to be abiding. Uh, they have an important repository role. Um, they really have to be custodians of the institutional memory. But the structures and personnel which the departing colonial services had left behind were neither willing to go along with the new realities, nor were they prepared to work under Nkrumah's Africanization of the civil service. The information that we have, the records do indicate that from the time of Ghana becoming, uh, achieving internal self-government 
up to 1957. Uh, and even in the period immediately following Ghana's uh, independence, the colonial civil service was reluctant to operate under an African government. And therefore that their loyalty was suspect. And, and the evidence would show that not only were they reluctant to do this, but, but also during the period of internal self government at the beginning and so forth, many records were hidden away from the government that Okroma led. Um, and so here you are in 1953, you have a group of people forming the Legislative Council of the country and the Nkrumah internal South government. To begin with, records of what was going on in the various ministries were unavailable to them. The new government would go ahead to formulate economic policies with the newly promoting Ghanaians from the old colonial structures. But what really was the central economic policy of the Nkrumah government? F. A. Jantua, who served as agricultural minister, is not only a big-time socialist, but revealer of Nkrumah's most philosophical work, Conscientiism, a sort of political economy of how to work a socialist system, but a defender of the good in such policies. Nkrumah was a socialist, basically. He wanted to build an economy based upon socialism. An economy based upon socialism is common ownership. The means of production, distribution, and it's, it's, it's that when we talk of public ownership, the economy belongs to the society as a whole. The, 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 the economy depends on the land. The policies certainly yielded dividends. Employment came with the expansion of the state enterprises, which by 1966 were 53, with 12 public boards. There was an increase in the number of public paid employees from about 98,000 to 250,000. We also saw an investment in the economy from about 19 to 25%. Not only that, but there was also a massive infrastructure development program. The construction of the Akasombo Dam, the Tema Harbour and the entire Tema Township, including the motorway. And during this period, we had a rapid growth in certain key social areas, primary schools, middle schools, teacher training colleges, universities, unbelievable growth. These were all areas that had experienced some growth, but very limited growth, very timid growth because of obvious colonial uh, uh, policies. But he said, no, we're going to change this. And you look at the orientation of these plans, they're actually almost identical to what South Korea, right around the same time, also adopted, which was one to produce consumer goods using imported machinery. And so what they did was to do surveys and find out what Ghanaians used most. So they found, for instance, that we use a lot of matches because we have to light charcoal and so forth and so on. And we're buying a lot of matches and importing them. So then he went ahead and set up the Kede match factory. And then they realized, well, we also need sugar for our cocoa and the rest of it. So the Commander Sugar Factory and other things. We have to wear shoes in the Kumasi Shoe Factory. So it was this rapid integrated approach to development calling for massive investments, which he made. People are often heard saying that, well, he squandered some huge amounts of monies that he inherited from the British, which is all false. What really happened was that at the time of independence in 1957, and Krumah said, wait a minute, you guys owe us 200 million pounds. This was money that the British forcibly took from us during the Second World War. They took from actually cocoa proceeds. As we exported the cocoa, they took the money along with some minimal interest that they set, which is actually quite a, quite a good deal. You borrowed the money on your own terms, which was what they did. And they used that to support the pound at the end of the Second World War, when the pound had more or less collapsed. So Nkrumah said, give us our money. And they did. They were kind enough to give us our 200 uh, million pounds. Then the question is, what did he use the money for? You look at the Kosomo Dam, which was then 70 million uh, pounds. We paid half of that. He was willing to pay all of it. But for obvious strategic reasons, the Americans, the World Bank, and the Brit British insisted on paying the remaining half. Uh, the Temahabo and the entire Tema Township was raised partly from that money. The motorway, which originally was supposed to run from Tema to Kumasi, 
Buankra, the Buankra inland port, and then to Paga in the north. All these things came from there. So if anything, the money wasn't even adequate to begin with, given the scale of projects and the ambition and the vision that you had for Ghana. And then come 1965, we had the collapse in cocoa prices, which then subverted the plan. It, it, it brought all the hardships, which rather unfortunately served as a basis for the military coup in 1966. And we haven't recovered from it yet. The major public policies during this period were embodied in the five-year development plan, for which Nkrumah had, with the agreement of the UNDP, invited the St. Lucian economist and future Nobel laureate in economics, W. Arthur Lewis, to manage. This was between 1957 to 1958. His plan was a mixed economy in outlook, and Lewis had wanted to use state intervention and planning to supplement the private sector foreign investment and the promotion of economic institutions bounded with the United Kingdom and the United States. But soon Nkrumah had sharp disagreements with Lewis and by 1961 the state had taken a central role in the economy. Lewis left and the second major plan was the seven-year development plan by which time the National Planning Commission had been established by Nkrumah. In 1962 H. Miller Craig, J. H. Mensah and T. T. Nair all Western-trained economists, had taken over the preparation of the plan. J. H. Mensah, who had graduated from the London School of Economics, like Arthur Lewis before him, finally emerged as the influential figure of the plan, but the ideological war was not over. And Cromer had insisted that Joseph Bagua, a 44-year-old former Karl Marx professor of trade at Budapest University, be included in the team. Nkrumah did not believe that the plan would have ideological dimensions, having criticised J.H. Mensah of lacking ideological purity. Gareth Austin, a reader in economic history at the London School of Economics, was asked whether there were smart public policies to combat the post-colonial economy, especially the two development plans. Smart, of course, depends on what your objectives mm. were, and governments always have political as well as economic objectives. Um, and they also operate, uh, as we all do, in the context of our time. Uh, the CPP government was given advice mm. from some of the most prominent economists of the day. And I suppose you could say they were selective in the extent to which they responded to it. But W.A. Lewis, the West Indian economist who mm. uh, won the Nobel Prize, um, wrote a famous report on industrialization and the Gold Coast in 1953, where he advised the Ghana government that it was too early to adopt a policy of import substitution industrialization, even though he himself had a famous model on how you could industrialize using cheap labor. Mm -hmm. He thought Ghana's labor is not cheap because the population is relatively light mm -hmm. in terms of the available land. So he could not see a way of going for industrialization early. Uh, in a sense, the uh, government followed that policy for a few years and then in 1961 adopts a more radical policy with much more government intervention and tries to achieve import substitution industrialization. Yeah. Uh, I suppose Lewis might say that they were too impatient. Yeah. Um, I think in retrospect, probably Lewis was right and that yeah. policy would have, to have been a bit more patient, would have been the more uh, effective policy. But at the time, that policy change that uh, Kwame Nkrumah made was uh, in line with what many other leading economists of the time were saying, which was the government has to lead in economic development. So at the time it would have seemed smart to many uh, people. By 1963, both the five and seven year development plans notwithstanding, the little structural changes recorded were not enough to propel anticipated growth. Agriculture accounted for 40% of GDP, manufacturing was 10% and especially from 1960 to 1966, the Economic Survey of Ghana 1966 indicated that there was no increase in GNP per capita. In addition, the population had increased by 17%. Although the reasons for this vary, the collapse in the price of cocoa by between 24 to 30% was a major factor. Cocoa is a commodity, which had been the live wire of the economy. Indeed, between 1954 to 1957, it led to almost a civil war, instigated by the big cocoa-growing Ashanti region. 
The Nkrumah government had decided that though there was increase in the world price of the commodity, the producer price would remain the same. Arguably, in doing this, Nkrumah was only adopting the British colonial strategy, which had created the Cocoa Marketing Board during the Second World War to hold up prices within the Gold Coast when they thought that the world price would fall. The British also discovered that it was a very good way of taxing the farmers when the world price was high. Nkrumah had intended that the windfall would be used to grow other sectors of the economy. Now, at this point, he was also more or less at loggerheads with the Americans, which I thought, uh, looking back now, was somewhat tactless on his part. Because you don't, the, when you face adversaries like that, you use your wits as opposed to trying to flex your muscle because they can easily swap you. So he was going through this period where he has these, these, these disagreements with Americans. So even when Ghana qualified in this period, for some sort of assistance from the IMF and the World Bank. The Americans were pulling the strings in the background, if you read the uh, declassified CIA documents, where they are saying, no, let's hold back. Let's not give him these funds to tide him over. Let's hold back the funds and create desperate conditions in Ghana that will lead to desperate actions on his part and therefore create the, 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 the pretext for a military coup. And the frightening thing is that that's precisely what is also being done in Zimbabwe today. But to Dr. Dirk Jan Ontezit of Oxford University, whose research work has centred on that period and also served as international lead economist for Adam Smith International in Africa, it was not the case. Now, the problem was that Nkrumah um, really used a lot of anti-colonial, anti-capitalist rhetoric. So there's no aid forthcoming from, uh, from the Western countries. Um, similarly, the uh, kind of emphasis on the state as a main actor really um, kind of like uh, put off lots of uh, pri uh, private sector investment. So aid in private sector uh, direct uh, foreign investment was about 10% mm. of the requirement. So the third one was borrowing. But the problem is most of the capital was tied up in um, uh, with Western countries, not a kind of like a countries which might be kind of um, uh, friendly to, mm. to, to, to the Nkrumah regime. So they had to resort to um, a uh, putting import restrictions on um, on, on various uh, various goods, just so import quotas uh, happen. And secondly, um, there was a lot of printing of money. Mm. So what was the result? Now we saw that first of all uh, by putting import restrictions, even the most basic ingredients for um, uh, for production weren't available. So uh, the, uh, the gold mining com uh, company didn't have enough fuel and explosives to actually mine the gold. Mm. Um, uh, the bamboo factoring uh, 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 manufacturer just spent about 80 times as much on wages than on, uh, on, um, on imported inputs. Um, so clearly uh, what you saw is like very, very low kind of um, utilization rates of these companies. For example, the uh, nationalized footwear company um, had only ha uh, uh, had a utilization rate of about 24%. So mm -hmm. really productivity was very, very low. At the same time, the government was printing money. So what did you get? You got um, uh, high inflation. Last three years of Nkrumah, we had a double-digit inflation. We saw that this vicious circle of there's, no, um, um, there's not enough uh, uh, foreign capital, so we have import quotas, so we can't, uh, uh, these companies couldn't buy the, uh, the, um, the inputs for the, uh, uh, um, uh, to actually um, uh, produce what they, what they want to produce. So there wasn't enough... Uh, exports, so there's a vicious circle going down um, and uh, as a result, so high inflation, negative um, uh, GDP per capita growth and um, part of it was financed by borrowing and the um, debt service ratio actually exceeded 50% when Nkrumah left power. So on all accounts, it really left the, uh, the state kind of almost was on the verge of bankruptcy. The economy at this time was not growing and political dissent within the country was growing with it. Also growing at this time was Nkrumah's fame and leadership of the Pan-African movement in Africa and the Caribbean, a global stature which had become an issue of concern to the Western protagonists of the Cold War. What happened is that um, Nkrumah derived his power because he uh, was accredited uh, with the independence of Ghana. That was his first level of support. Mm. Secondly, he raised expectations um, that... Um, Ghana would be the shining example of Africa within 10 years. Now, that was not going to, to happen. So 
the vicious circle of economic decline um, clearly was uh, made, made that people lost faith and he lost popular support. Mm. But one of the things of the uh, uh, vicious circle uh, downward, uh, downward spiral was that there's more and more price controls. Mm. Therefore, more and more quotas uh, could be allocated to supporters. So it actually gave the ingredients of setting up a patronage network. Mm. Um, but at a certain point, even that didn't work. <laughs> Some called it the end of illusion, to others it was the imperialist curtailment of the great march forward. There is space and evidence for all of this, but few could bet that a small man with big ideological fame would be able to carry the Western Africa post-independent state as a fodder in an ideologically charged Cold War of the 1960s. Vietnam in Central Asia was the unintended transit and Conakry became home away from home. But the shadows of the past lingered on and the future economic development would grow out of the unsettled past.